Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Ross Greer. I'm an MSP for the West of Scotland, and I'm the convener of the Scottish Parliament's cross-party group on Tibet. I'd really like to welcome you all here this afternoon for our event on information and disinformation, controlling the narrative as a tactic of war and of peace. And to welcome you to the Scottish Parliament for what is the 18th year that we've ran the Festival of Politics here. So the Festival of Politics has, has finally come of age. It's been a really brilliant journey for the Parliament. This is an exciting opportunity for us to welcome far more people through the doors to engage in the kind of conversations that aren't necessarily always possible uh, between parliamentarians in the, the normal course of our debates. I think this event that we've got running at the moment, this was an idea that our cross-party group on Tibet have had for quite a while, and an issue that we've been very interested in, but that has unfortunately become much more relevant and much more timely due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm delighted that we've got an expert panel here to join us this afternoon. So I'm going to introduce everyone on the panel and then we'll get stuck straight into this. So immediately uh, on my right, your left, we've got Joanna uh, Shostek, who is a lecturer in political communication at the University of Glasgow. She's also an associate fellow of Ru the Russia and Eurasia programme at Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs. To my left, we've got uh, Dr. Sering uh, Topgal, who is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Birmingham. He's a political scientist with research interest in Chinese politics and foreign policy and Asia-Pacific affairs with attention to security and ethno-nationalism. Dr. Topkow's latest book is China and Tibet, The Perils of Insecurity. Joining us online, we've got Olga Robinson, who is the assistant editor at BBC Monitoring, which reports and analyzes news from media around the world. She's an experienced Russian media analyst. She specializes in information manipulation and disinformation techniques, so very relevant to this discussion. Olga's also a native Russian speaker and has most recently been covering the war in Ukraine. And finally, uh, we've got uh, on my far right, though politically I'm sure that's not the case, uh, we've got uh, James Blake, who's Head of Media and Humanities at Edinburgh Napier University. Uh, James has worked on the ITV News at 10 as a specialist home affairs producer for Channel 4 News, as a news reporter for Channel 4, uh, and he worked as a reporter and programme producer for STV News and the STV Scotland Tonight Current Affairs programme. So with that, we're going to dive straight in, just uh, starting off with a, a question to, to frame our discussion, and we'll uh, put this one to Olga in the first instance. Olga, could you just tell us from your perspective, what, what is disinformation? What are we trying to grapple with and talk about this afternoon? Well, it's a very good question, and it's one of the classic ones. You get asked as a disinformation expert. So disinformation um, in the way we tackle it uh, is the spread of false or misleading information with the intent to uh, benefit personally or financially or politically. And this is how this is exactly why this intent, this element of intent, deliberate spread of misleading information or false information is how we distinguish it from misinformation. Because, you know, um, at a time of crisis in particular, or breaking news situation, a lot of people do spread misleading information and false information, but they do so without necessarily having some in nefarious intent. And that's that's how we define the two and differentiate those uh, in our work. Thanks very much. And Joanna, how would you distinguish between this new wave of uh, this new challenge that we're facing and the, the misinformation that we've always seen in political communication, particularly in, in geopolitics? Yeah, I mean, misinfor misinformation and disinformation are, are not new problems. Um, I mean, you can go back to World War One, World War Two, and I mean, th there were use of rumours, there was use of misleading information back even back then, probably go back even further. Um, I think what's new is the environment in which disinformation and misinformation now circulates. Um, so if you think about the speed with which misinformation and disinformation can spread, the number of people, how easy it is to put misinformation and disinformation out there, which means that you know, pretty much any, anyone with a, with a device connected to the internet can, can be sort of part of this problem, fueling this problem. Um, and the fragmentation of audiences. Um, I mean, that's been a, a sort of major change of the past sort of few decades that um, you know, people these days can select themselves into, into niche sort of people call them bubbles um, and, and yeah, basically surround themselves with, with, with one, I guess, worldview um, in which information, disinformation is an important part. So. Thanks. And saying, I'm coming at this from the, the point of view of somebody who's had a, a long term interest in the Chinese occupation of Tibet and the fate of the Tibetan people. I think quite a lot of folk will have become 
somewhat more familiar with this issue in recent months due to the situation in Russia and Ukraine. But could you tell us a little bit about how information warfare has been used in the context of China's territorial claims to other territories like Tibet? Yeah, <clears throat> the first thing to note is that um, histor historically China has you know, a tradition or a practice of controlling information, right? So both misinformation and disinformation played out even during the imperial periods, you know, burning of books, uh, you know, uh, succeeding dynasties, writing the history of the preceding dynasty to you know, uh, benefit the current dynasty, right? And um, in, in the uh, current sort of period of the People's Republic of China, where China is ruled by the Communist Party, you will see that uh, one of the three main sort of uh, pillars of power is the propaganda department. There's the military, and then there's the internal, internal security uh, you know, uh, dimension. But the third element is the propaganda uh, department. And control over that is you know, crucial for the top leader or the Communist Party to you know, retain power. And um, you know, in Tibet, as well as in other uh, places like Xinjiang, uh, in Hong Kong, and also you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, very clearly uh, on Taiwan, and also you can say other uh, territorial disputes in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, uh, both misinformation and disinformation uh, from China's part uh, are very strong elements of China's strategy. Right? And in fact, uh, information war and psychological warfare are crucial elements of China's strategies towards Taiwan, for example, and other uh, territories uh, that China is contesting with other countries. James, you have substantial experience in what we now call tr traditional media. Most traditional media outlets have been experiencing pretty, certainly in this country, long-term decline in levels of public trust and, and satisfaction. Not consistent, but there, there have been significant challenges there. How are traditional media outlets responding to this, this new challenge, whether it comes from state actors or more organic conspiracy theories on social media? Um, well, most of my background has been in broadcasting, in radio, first of all, and, and then in television. So I'm coming at this very much from a, from, a, from a TV point of view. I think there is a real important role for traditional media outlets, which is, which is focused on trust. You know, where we're in a digital landscape, where more and more people are watching online and on social media, where there are so many people engaged in this sort of in creating multimedia content i think there is a it's really important that there are organizations and individuals that we can turn to who are telling stories and creating content that we can trust and i think that's a hugely important role and i think it's becoming more important particularly in a situation where we have a, a big conflict in in the, in the heart of europe where truth inevitably disappears um, where we need uh, people that we can turn to, uh, journalists and reporters and programmes and, uh, and content, where we can, tr where we can trust them to, to be... I'm not talking about telling the truth, because, you know, telling the truth is a hard thing, but, but, but who are telling stories that are, that are fair, that are accurate, that are balanced as, as much as can be. And I think, you know, part, part of this is... There's a real opportunity for journalists here, where you've got so many citizen journalists, and it's a phrase that I, that I don't like, but where there are so many people who are, uh, are using their devices to, to film things, to interview things, to tell stories about the community that they're in. And if we're talking Ukraine, I think there's re it's really important that people in Ukraine can tell those stories. And I think that's a real opportunity for traditional media organisations to reach out to those people, to work with them, to become a partner with them and to enable those stories to be told. But equally, we have to make sure that we can trust those people that we are, that we are working with. Uh, and that can be a really difficult thing to do because, yes, you might get some video content, you might get some interviews from established media players, from agencies like Reuters and AP and so on. You have uh, fixers on the ground, people that you uh, work with on the ground, and that's great. But what happens when somebody approaches you unsolicited with really interesting story and content? How do you verify it? And how do you verify it if you're sitting at a desk 
in London or, 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 or in Edinburgh. So there's real opportunities here, but there are, there are real dangers, I think, for journalists. Absolutely. Now that we've, I hope, set the, the scene of the general challenge, we're going to look at a couple of the specific situations starting off, as, as you would expect, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I should probably declare an interest at this point in that last week the Russian government sanctioned uh, me for reasons that I don't quite yet understand, but I apparently now have a personal stake in this. I can't say it massively disturbed my holiday plans. I wasn't planning on going to Vladivostok anytime soon. Um, but, Olga, if we could start off with yourself, it'd be interesting to hear some of your observations about how the Russian and Ukrainian governments have been trying on all sorts of levels, both with their own populations and globally, to try and control the narrative around the war. So it'd be interesting to hear from you about the ways in which they're trying to do that and the relative success that each is having. Well, the success question is a very interesting one and a very complex one. But uh, let me give you a brief overview of um, what Ukraine and Russia have been doing to control the narrative. Obviously, both sides have been involved in an in information war um, around the actual um, the actual invasion. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, um, as some of my colleagues at BBC Monitoring who cover Ukraine have pointed out, they have deployed so far things like memes and um, urban myths. Um, for example, the very famous story now of the ghost of Kiev, you know, that, that's been doing the rounds, a really viral story, but just the only problem is that that the um, the fighter uh, jet pilot doesn't actually exist, and um, and uh, it's more of a it's more of a collective image um, of the defenders of uh, of Kiev at the beginning of the war, um, as Ukrainian official, officials did admit in the end. Now, uh, when it comes to memes, obviously, uh, probably everybody knows that meme about the. Um, the Russian Russian ship, let's translate it as go away, <laughs> um, but uh, it was a bit more rude than that. Um, and that's used now, you know, everywhere, even in merchandise, I can, I've, I've seen it. And from that perspective, these kind of, the use of this kind of very um, punchy memes and, and good, feel good stories that really stick with people and you hear about them over and over again and in a way that's kind of a success of them uh, one might say um, and even today earlier today uh, with um, uh, as satellite images were, were coming out um, from Crimea um, from the, the Russian airfield that was hit um, the Russian def uh, the Ukrainian defense ministry actually um released a sort of tongue-in-cheek video on twitter which has already been uh watched one million times as i just checked um and in in it they in a very kind of ironic way encouraging russian tourists not to come to crimea because uh well it may not necessarily be safe anymore um and that kind of approach is very very different from what you can see coming out of russia now what we are seeing coming from the Russian side is that um, whenever it comes to attacks that are blamed on Russia or um, any uh, incidents like Bu the Bucha, uh, killings of civilians in Bucha, what we are seeing in response to um, to these uh, incidents from Russia is, as one of the disinformation researchers is described as a fire hose of disinformation, when um, Russian the whole ecosystem of Russian media and a number of disinformation actors um, affiliated with that are trying to pollute the information space with a number of, or as many as possible, confusing and at times contradictory theories um, that are not necessarily aimed at convincing anyone that, um, that you know, the, that, this or that particular theory is correct but it's more likely aimed to confuse people and just make them think oh well it, it, it's just too much too much information i'm going to switch off and nobody knows the truth we'll never know um now what whether that is having an impact is an interesting question because on the one hand when i speak to people who still live in Russia and some of the people I know um, and also people we interview for, for various stories, you can hear people are echoing some of those allegations and some of those theories and saying, well, 
how about this? How about that? We we may not necessarily, uh, we're not being told everything. We may not necessarily know the whole truth. Um, but whether that is coming because they are bombarded with that kind of information, they live in an information bubble, or it's they are doing it because it's psychologically difficult for them to accept that um, what the Russian soldiers are doing in Ukraine um, may not necessarily be what they think. Um, and whether that kind of psychological effect is having an impact rather than them believing uh, disinformation, well, that, that's a question that is really difficult to answer. Um, but we do know that quite a lot of people in Russia, and that come uh, and that is evident from even independent polls that are being conducted that the majority the most the, the majority of the population is supporting the invasion and most likely the propaganda um that is coming out of the russian media um and the whole kind of russian media ecosystem russian state media ecosystem is having an impact for sure you mentioned two quite interesting examples of Ukrainian uh, government propaganda, the, the first being the Russian warship Go F Yourself Snake Island incident. That was primarily aimed at the Ukrainian population themselves to, to inspire resilience and, and globally amongst Ukraine's allies. But th you mentioned another example there of uh, the Ukrainian government producing propaganda directed at the Russian population, in this case about Crimea, which as a tourist resort, the, the occupation annexation of Crimea was a real high point for Putin in terms of domestic popularity. So any attempt by the Ukrainians to undermine Russian public confidence in his ability to, to hold it would be really important. I think it's fair to say that the, the first of those attempting to inspire the Ukrainian population and global allies has been successful. How much evidence is there that Ukraine's propaganda is reaching the Russian population, is having their desired effect of undermining confidence in the operation in the government and Putin himself? Well, we need to look at the kind of information ecosystem that exists in Russia, and it's fairly difficult overall for Ukrainian messaging to reach vast numbers of the Russian population. Let's not forget that the majority of Russians still are using television, state television, as the main source of news. Obviously, that kind of messaging from the Ukrainian side is not going to appear on on the Russian uh, on Russian television unless they want to mock it or or uh, present it in, in a way that suits them. Now, when it comes to online, uh, things are slightly different and you can find alternative information online, but you have to look for it. So YouTube is not banned and you can find, uh, for example, um, one of um, a former lawyer, a lawyer and opposition activist, uh, Fagin has, uh, has a YouTube channel for his fairly popular and he does uh, he does interview uh, interviews with Ukrainian officials and you can access it from Russia um, the question is you need to know where to find that channel and you need to actually go and look for it and it does not like for example if you are an ordinary Russian and you only use YouTube to find recipes um, or um, I don't know fun videos or cat videos you won't be necessarily served information about Ukraine so if you have no doubts about it, whether what is happening in Ukraine is a special military operation, um, as the uh, Russian authorities are calling it, um, then you just won't go to YouTube and find that information. Now, uh, we know that access to Twitter is restricted, Instagram, yes, people can use um, VPNs, but again, it's fairly tax savvy people. A lot of people um, in the kind of um smaller towns and villages probably would not necessarily know not many of them would know how to use vpns um so it's a bit tricky so i'm um, it's possible that the information coming out of ukraine is reaching some people in russia and it's sort of trickling in into the information space but i find it hard to believe that it's reaching masses of population because of the sheer the sheer the kind of because of the efforts by the Kremlin to control the narrative that is happening in the country and let's not, let's not forget that even when people try to check in Russia try to check um, 
I don't know whether, and then go on, on the Yandex um, search engine, which is the largest search engine in Russia, millions of people um, are seeing on the front page five top, top news stories um, from Russian media, and they come from from pro Kremlin sources or or present and they present what's happening in Ukraine in a very certain way. And these people, even though they're not necessarily looking for anything related to Ukraine, they are passively consuming the messaging by just, you know, you just look and you just see that on the front page. You can't get away from it. Um, and yeah, and we shouldn't underestimate just how complex the the Russian authorities' efforts are to try and control the narrative in the country, both in the kind of traditional media, but also um, also online. And Joanna, how would you rate the Russian propaganda <laughs> efforts' success so far? I'm particularly interested not just in their domestic efforts, but their mm -hmm. attempts to shape the narrative globally. Because mm -hmm. I think for a lot of folk here, if if anybody sees Russian propaganda around the the war, most of it is so laughable it's pretty easy to dismiss from our perspective. Mm -hmm. But that's a very Anglo-centric or, or European mm -hmm. perspective. There's a lot more to the world than that. Has Russian propaganda around the war had more success in, in other parts of the world and former Soviet republics, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to judge the sort of impact effect of any kind of media content or propaganda. You know, it's hard to distinguish the effect of the media from, say, pre-existing views and opinions. Um, I mean, there are certainly parts of the world where certain elements of Russia's narrative resonate and, and sort of fit with what people, how people understand the world, for example. I mean, I, I think sorry, China is a particularly um, sort of interesting case because I think, you know, many Chinese citizens plus Chinese sort of government officials will share this very, very negative view of the West, of, of NATO, of the United States. And so when Russia blames NATO and the West and the United States for what's happening in Ukraine and, and sort of, the, yeah, the, the sort of um, very, very anti-Western rhetoric, I mean, within China, that, that has a certain resonance. Um, can we say that's an effect of Russian propaganda? Probably not, because the Chinese information space is so restricted. I, I'm not sure you could give, it cre give, the, give the Russian propaganda sort of credit for that. And there are other parts of the world as well. So, sort of, I think Hungary, so even within the EU, you know, that there are sort of certain audiences where elements of the Russian narrative um, do resonate. But I mean, globally, I mean, I think um, Russia was sort of in a losing position from the very start when it came to public opinion, just because not violating the borders of a neighboring state, not bombing civilians, not leveling cities, is such a sort of fundamental basic principle of, of what it means to, you know, to be decent and to, to be human. I mean, they, they've just sort of violated those, those norms and values. Um, so, so trying to kind of persuade people that, that Russia is somehow in the right um, was always going to be a mammoth task for the Russians. So outside of Russia itself, of course. Um, Can I just jump in very quickly here? Please do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because when we talk about whether Russian efforts are um, effective in the West and in Europe in particular, I think it would be fair to say that largely in the kind of mainstream society, if I may say so, hasn't been effective, but Let's not forget there's also conspiracy circles and there are people on the fringe who are already, who have already been primed to accepting this kind of idea. So people who are somehow suspicious of the establishment, um, suspicious of the West, have very, very strong anti-Western anti sentiment, anti-US sentiment. We are seeing, and we're seeing it a lot on Telegram, they are quite receptive to the Russian messaging. And actually, uh, one of the most successful messages that I've seen were about around biolabs in Ukraine. Um, the, the the claims that US-funded biolabs in, in Ukraine are somehow involved in the production of bioweapons. Bio it's been widely debunked, but we, we keep seeing it um, mentioned as a factor in in like your non circles in, in Europe and elsewhere and, and other fringe conspiracy circles and anti-vax circles and so on. So so that's something, yes, these are fairly small numbers and these are fringe communities, but we shouldn't ignore that factor altogether. Absolutely. I mean, I, 
as a relatively low profile politician who has spoken up for Ukraine, I get messages every single day across social media platforms in my email inbox from people who, for example, in the case of the biolabs, were absolutely convinced the reason the Ukrainians were fighting to the death for Mariupol and Azovstal was because there was a lab underneath that steel plant with three Canadian generals in it coordinating a chemical weapons programme. I mean, patently ridiculous, but there was a, a very, very, very online community of people who bought into that for the kind of reasons that Olga's mentioning of being already massively disenfranchised, mistrustful of, of the Western establishment. Sam, I'm interested to turn to you now, though, on the comparison between this very modern blow-by-blow -blow update kind of, uh, sorry, no pun in intended there, uh, war that we're seeing, a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine that we are observing in real time through social media with a Chinese occupation of, of Tibet that happened decades ago and is now in a situation where Tibet is the least free place on earth, the most information restricted place on earth. If the Chinese invasion and occupation had happened now, I realise this is a, a far-fetched hypothetical, how differently do you think that kind of situation would play out when you're looking at, for example, how China's aspirations for Taiwan are being observed in the media right now, the situation with Russia and Ukraine? Do you think there could have been a very different situation for Tibet if the information flow was, was different, if, if the technology that we have now simply existed then? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, it's important to note some uh, striking sort of um, uh, similarities uh, between uh, how the invasion and the current rule of Tibet by the Chinese has played out and, you know, what happened in Ukraine. In fact, when uh, in the early days of the you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, uh, not, you know, after the Crimea sort of invasion, but the current round of uh, invasion going on, uh, when President Zelensky was sort of scrambling to rally his country and, you know, trying to seek international support, particularly military support, my thoughts went back to the Tibetan, Tibetan leaders uh, in 1949 and 1950, when the PR, People's Republic of China declared uh, through radio sort of uh, broadcasts that, the, you know, Tibet and Taiwan were left to be liberated, the, the exact word that they used. And, you know, it was a matter of time before uh, Tibet will be liberated, right? So um, I, my thought went to how the Tibetan leaders at that time might have felt, right? Um, uh, so, you know, um, there are striking similarities in the sense that, you know, China uh, sort of decided to invade and justified the invasion and you know, uh, ongoing occupation as a, as a liberation. Uh, uh, and liberation uh, you know, from who is the question uh, that many people asked at that time. And from the Chinese point of view, Tibet was being run by uh, a small sort of uh, section of feudal lords uh, you know, uh, who are in turn sort of masterminded by imperialists, British imperialists, Americans, and also, you know, the, the Indians, uh, right? So China's liberation of the, you know, Tibetan serfs, uh, as they called uh, most Tibetans, was, you know, uh, from these feudal lords and imperialist uh, sort of uh, actors. Uh, and then, you know, they also justify by trying to rewrite uh, the history of Tibet and China, right? So I think similar, you know, things ha happened you know, when uh, Putin tried to justify the Russian invasion of Ukraine, trying to go back to history and also talking about, you know, the, the existence of Nazis and the need to, you know, liberate Russians or the uh, Ukrainians from these Nazi uh, people. So there are some important, uh, you know, uh, similarities. Also the, the action reaction dynamic between uh, Chinese information and disinformation campaign on the other hand and reaction by the Tibetans, right? It's important to remember uh, there, is the, uh, there are Tibetans inside Tibet, but there are uh, Tibetan exiles with, you know, uh, with something like a government in exile, uh, which Tibetans call the Central Tibetan Administration in India. Uh, and one of the departments or the ministries within the exile government is called the Information and International Relations uh, Department, right? So it has its own uh, information strategy. Uh, but even inside Tibet, uh, despite these 
very strong you know, censorship and control by the Chinese authorities. Sometimes even Tibetans inside Tibet managed to sort of uh, speak back uh, and react to Chinese uh, propaganda or information uh, strategy, right? So there are some uh, uh, you know, significant similarities. But, uh, but Tibet is fully under Chinese control, while Russia, you know, Ukraine is, you know, at least most of it, is still you know, sort of independent. So it, it can act more with more independence, with, uh, has more agency. Uh, so that's I important to keep in mind. Uh, um, with regard to uh, how you know, uh, the invasion would have played out if it happened now, right? I think it, it's, it's important to point out that you know, uh, maybe it made, would, would have made a difference. You know, it would have allowed the Tibetans to unite more quickly and strongly, uh, you know, united front, if the Tibetans from all the Tibetan plateau were able to see what the Chinese were doing in different places in Tibet. The Tibetan leaders and the government at that time may have been able to mobilize the population uh, much more strongly, like Zelensky did, and also uh, get more international support. The international public opinion may have been more supportive, right? So there are all these uh, things, uh, but Ultimately, I'm sort of uh, wondering whether all of the, this benefit from you know, information uh, would uh, have uh, sort of overcome the, the real politic. Uh, the, you know, if you look at the British uh, policy towards Tibet in the 19th century and 20th century when Britain ruled India, uh, the, the, the most common refrain was uh, you know, uh, avoiding you know, the wrath of China, right? Uh, so uh, people, you know, uh, British uh, colonial of officials like the uh, uh, political officer in Sikkim or later the British representative in Lhasa, the, the Tibetan capital, um, they were, they knew the ground situations. They interacted more with Tibetan government and Tibetan officials. Uh, and they were much more sympathetic to the Tibetan positions, right? But then if you move to the India office, the colonial sort of government of India, uh, they had their own sort of interests, which is to protect India from the northern threats from Russia or elsewhere. And then if you move up the hierarchy to London, uh, to the foreign ministry, uh, uh, they were mostly dealing with China, right? Uh, so from their point of view, China was much more significant as an economic partner and uh, a strategic partner, and Tibet did not have resources and things like that at that point uh, to justify Brit stronger British support and all of that. And then also if you look at the Indian government's response to Chinese uh, you know, invasion of Tibet, uh, India was of course a, a new republic, you know, be you know, becoming independent only in 1947. But when China decided to liberate or invade Tibet in 1949, after the establishment of the PRC, India's, if you look at the communication between the Indian government and the Chinese government, India was most directly affected right, by the Chinese occupation of Tibet. You, you see the border dispute that is going on and the clashes in the Himalayas and all the other threats to Indian security from China's uh, position in Tibet. But in those days, India's uh, main sort of uh, communication with Beijing was, you know, you're doing it at the wrong time, you know, liberating or invading Tibet. Because India's thinking at that point was, you know, uh, to get China PRC into the United Nations. Uh, you know, India was telling the Chinese, you're doing it at the wrong time because we want China to become a United Nations member. Mm -hmm. And that is the main sort of uh, interest of the international community, of Asia, of India. And you know, your sort of uh, plan to invade or liberate Tibet is going to jeopardize all of that, right? There was no desire to protect Tibet, Tibetan interest or Tibetan sovereignty at that point. So my, you know, coming back to my point about whether all of these benefits of information would have overcome the, the real polity calculations of the countries uh, is, uh, I think, a big question. Quite a lot of speculation now, understandably, as a result of Russia's invasion has turned towards China and their aspirations never ceded since 1949 for Taiwan. 
the Chinese and Taiwanese governments are both very closely observing the situation between Russia and Ukraine and the wider global response to it. What lessons do you think they're both learning, particularly on the communication and misinformation side of this? Oh, yeah. Um, the uh, information and psychological warfare is a very crucial part of the PLA's plan to you know, take over uh, Taiwan. Right? And, and uh, you know, going back to the uh, you know, uh, imperial period where you know, deception and the use of information and misinformation, disinformation as a military strategy was very strong. Right? So it, it, it is an important element of the PLA's strategy to take over Taiwan. And the Taiwanese have been living with these strategies. Uh, hackings, denial of services, operations. You know, it, it happened when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan recently, when the Taiwanese government was not able to use its uh, sort of uh, internet and information system for, for a while. And Taiwan is particularly vulnerable because the on, its only access to internet is through an undersea cable, uh, which runs from China, right? So if the Chinese cut that, uh, Taiwanese are very vulnerable, right? So which is why the Taiwanese government is uh, trying to develop alternatives, sat satellite-based alternatives to become less dependent upon, upon, uh, upon China. So uh, it is a very important part of the Chinese strategy and the Taiwanese have lived with this for a while and they are also developing counter strategies, right? And one, I think one of the good things from the Taiwan's perspective of China's recent military drills around Taiwan is uh, the, you know, the Chinese revealed what kind of assets they're going to deploy, how they're going to uh, you know, uh, isolate Taiwan, uh, keep the Americans away, and try to take over. Right? So the Taiwanese and Americans and other interested parties would have learned lessons, they learned about China's strategies, and would, I think, closely observe it and develop counter strategies. James, how, how are broadcasters grappling with this issue? Because I'm interested in particular in how the, the tradition, and in the case of the UK, the requirement for impartiality in broadcasting comes up against a situation where either there is, in the case of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, one clear aggressor and defender, or in the case of some of these particular theories, some of it, it, it's, it might be objectively false, but there's a significant group of people who may believe in it. How do broadcasters wrestle uh, between providing fair and accurate coverage and fulfilling the, the duty, the obligation to be impartial and balanced? So, that, I mean, that, that, there's loads here, and it's really interesting to see how the discussion has moved, China and, and, and Tibet or, or so on. I, let, me come to, let me come to your question through, through a slightly uh, uh, a longer way, I think I talked before about how citizen journalism can be a real opportunity and I think the fact that people, everybody almost has a, has a camera in their pocket can be a really good thing and I've lost count of how many demonstrations and riots and protests I've been on but what has been wonderful I think is that um, the fact that people are there filming what is going on, ordinary people are filming is what's going on, means I hope that the police or the army or whoever are in positions of power will think twice before they, are, before they overstep the mark, before they are too violent against protesters in front of them. And I have seen it happen. Um, uh, uh, and I think that is a really important and wonderful thing that, that the, the, this, you know, uh, where we have citizens who are there recording being witnesses on the ground and recording that, I think that, that is a wonderful thing. Um, we did have that in Tibet. There are, I think in 2009, there, is, there are some images of a big demonstration in 2009 against the Chinese invasion, and some grainy footage came out of um, Chinese uh, uh, officials and authorities being quite violent against protesters and, and, and monks and so on. Um, and what then happened was the Chinese d said that these were fake and released their own images of w w who they claimed were Tibetan protesters just destroying property and so on. And I think the one real, um, or, or one of the important things that is a real shame about this climate of disinformation 
is that it enables people who are in positions of power, who have been caught doing wrong things because they've been filmed, it enables them to say it's fake. And I think, and I think that, is a, that is a real shame because even though we have, we have evidence there, even though we have, all they need to do is go, it's fake, and it, and it just plants that seed of doubt. And already we're talking, well, maybe it didn't quite happen that way and, and, and everything else. And it goes back to what Olga and, uh, uh, and Joanna were talking about just in terms of the success of the propaganda operation that's coming out of, of Russia. All you need to do is, start, is, is get people questioning it. It feeds into con conspiracy theories, but then other people start talking about it. And although it might be quickly debunked, hopefully by media organisations and by BBC monitoring and, and uh, journalists that are doing a wonderful job, the fact that we're talking about it and the fact that it's in the public domain and it's kind of spreading means that it's done their job. It means that the, 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 the propaganda has done its job. And that, I think, is, that, I think, is a real shame. So going back to your question, what can, what can media organisations do? I think media organisations can help debunk uh, uh, videos in particular where they are false. And I think you know, BBT Monitoring does a fantastic job. I think other fact check services do a great job. There are also independent organisations that do that. I think that's really important. I think, I think more widely, we are all becoming experts in video-based forensic analysis, which I, think is, which I think is really interesting, that we are now actively looking at video that we see online and thinking, and I hope this is true of, of, of most people, and are thinking, is this true? Is this right? Let's look into it, because there's a lot of video that's coming that's, uh, that's old or that's been treated or, 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 or slowed down in a way, that has come from the 2014 conflict and not from now. Um, and it's really interesting. There was a, there was a, a video from Ukraine recently that there was a fire at a fuel depot. And um, people online started to say, hang on a second, that must be fake because some of the firefighters have got Edmonton, uh, 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 Canada on the back. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out that, that the, the fire department in Edmonton had donated a lot of uh, 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 fire jackets to Ukraine and the firefighters in Ukraine. But the fact that it was doubted and that people raised that question, I think that's a good thing, that we're, that we're watching videos and we're looking at that content with critical eyes, and then it turns out to be true, and, it's, and, and that's great. But the fact that, you know, and I think it beholds all of us to be a bit skipped, to be skeptical and to do our own legwork in terms of what we trust what we share importantly, and therefore, which organisations, which journalists, which reporters do we go to for the stories about the world? Joanna, there's quite a lot of focus on this at the moment, um, but the focus is on governments that would be considered hostile to our own Russian uh, disinformation, Chinese disinformation and censorship. The reality of certainly the, the post-Second World War era is Britain and America have engaged in this yeah. extensively as well, whether it was about tilting the scales of elections in Italy and France when the communists were surging, mm -hmm. overthrowing governments in, in South America. Is this current focus on Russia and China distorting the, the scale and the, the frequency of state-sponsored disinformation campaigns globally? Because is the reality simply that every government that's capable of doing this is doing this all the time on a greater or lesser scale? Um, I mean, I would agree that many governments, including our own, um, have at various points in history engaged in spreading disinformation. I mean, there are books written about the UK's sort of, um, yeah, experience of that through the Cold War. Um, it's quite interesting to read about. Um, I mean, I would also not want to sort of be too, I guess, relativist about this. Oh, everybody do, does it, and therefore, you know, what, what the Russians are doing, it's, it's, you know, we do it too, it's not that bad, you know, everybody does it, it's not that bad. Um, I, I think that's a s slippery slope um, because I think what actually the Russian government likes to do is to draw parallels between um, the sort of Western media assistance in certain countries that are trying to democratise and, you know, what, their efforts to, to sort of spread anti-democratic values in, in other countries. I mean, I, I think values are sort of central to this. So... If, 
Yeah, I mean, you've got to look at, you know, I guess, um, well, I mean, I don't think disinformation should be spread um, in, in any context, to be honest, but um, is it sometimes right for Western governments to sponsor news content for, for people, audiences in other parts of the world? I would say if those audiences in other parts of the world aren't being served by domestic media well, then absolutely, because I am unashamedly pro-democracy. And if, you know, supporting journalism in other parts of the world is, is part of that kind of encouraging the, the development of free speech, encouraging reporting about topics that are important, including corruption and that kind of thing, um, you know, I, I, would, I would be supportive of that. But, you know, the, the other side of the fence is that, you know, these are all sovereign states, this, and this is the argument that you get from countries like Russia and China, which is that, you know, the UK, the US, the EU should mind their own business and stay out of our, you know, informational environment. Um, yeah, you, you pick your values and, and you, you take your position, I guess, on that. Um, in the case of a media institution, whether it's BBC mm -hmm. World Service or, or Voice of America, where there, there is a very deliberate um, mm -hmm. effort to make sure that that news and information is reaching countries where that perspective mm -hmm. wouldn't otherwise be the case, is there a need for a greater level of democratic scrutiny here in Britain and America over those services than there would be, mm -hmm. say, compared to how the BBC is typically scrutinised at either UK or, or Scottish level? Does it require something different because it is about directly intervening in another mm -hmm. sovereign state? Yeah, I mean, oversight is critically important. Um, and in the past, um, mistakes have been made in terms of the, the level of oversight that was um, sort of given to, to, to various um, you know, Western-funded broadcasters. I actually teach a class at Glasgow University that looks at the 1956 Hungarian Revolution when um, sort of Cold War broadcasters from the United States were sort of accused of fueling revolution there that, that led to a severe crackdown and, and people kind of losing their lives. So this, yeah, you, I think there's got to be critical thinking, there's got to be good oversight, um, monitoring of, of you know, how um, yeah, Western broadcasters, news providers, um, what their aims are, what kind of content they're sharing. Because uh, this is, this is comp complex and, and complicated sort of stuff that we're talking about, really. Um, but does, you know, the, this, this claim that, you know, that this, you know, Western governments shouldn't at all help fund um, some kind of journalism for, for audiences that are, you know, um, in, in non-democratic countries, um, I personally would, would not support the sort of cutting it off entirely view. Um, I'd like to throw this one open to, to everyone on the panel. Quite often in, in recent years, and particularly since the election of Donald Trump, Brexit, Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, some of the, the most extreme claims that have been made is that this new wave of disinformation and these new techniques are an existential threat to democracy, or at least that the Western ideal of liberal democracy, the post-war, the end of history idea that we've reached this point of, of stability. What is your perspective on that take? Do, are we facing an existential threat to democracy as we understand it? Or are we simply moving into a, a, a different phase, a more robust and combative phase certainly, but one which democracy can certainly withstand? Can I, I let me kind of respond to that by just saying that I fear governments get invol getting involved in stopping the spread of disinformation. Because I think that is a real dangerous slippery slope to go down because um, who then decides what is, what is true and what is not true? Is that the government that decides that? that uh, and what happens if they decide that anything that is negative about, their, uh, about them, what if they decide that that's disinformation? And we have seen this happen quite recently. In Pakistan, there's quite a worrying rule, I think, from 2020 that's that's tied up in the online abuse, uh, pre preventing online harm, which says actually the Pakistani government decides what is, what is uh, uh, disinformation and it can cut it out. And there's a similar rule in Vietnam. So I, I think it's really dangerous having government clamp down on the spread of disinformation because I think we should be free to criticise the government and they should... Uh, uh, shouldn't be able to, to stop that under the guise of stopping disinformation. I think what we can do is we can uh, encourage education, to encourage people to be critical about what they watch. I think we need to, we need to have more media organisations, need to, to have a duty to, to, to stamp it out. I think social media organisations have a duty to police their own platforms, but I don't think it should be left to government. Olga, were you looking to come in on that? Well, I'm a practitioner, so to me, um, 
you know, a threat of disinformation. Um, I mean, it's a daily, it's my job. <laughs> and um, whether it's a threat to democracy, I, I'd leave that question to um, to academics because I, I think it's more of a more comfortable area for them. But I would absolutely agree on the point about media literacy because I think it's so important and actually part of the remit of my team, what my team does, um, particularly at a time of crises and when there's a lot of a lot of footage um, pouring it um, in from various places like for example at the start of the um, Ukraine war we just saw an absolute avalanche of, of videos and footage from Ukraine and not from Ukraine presented as being from Ukraine um, and what my team does and also the wider um, disinformation unit at BBC News is we often try and you know get on air produce very quick quickly produce digital videos just explaining and offering tips to people on how they can themselves spot what is wrong with footage, how they can spot disinformation, how they can track it. And it's really good to hear feedback from ordinary people who say, thank you for doing this, because that is really helping. And also, like, when we see the story about biolabs, like just a very quick anecdote, um, this story, I felt really strongly about do, about pushing back against the biolabs claims, although, you know, they, they do sound quite, whoa, out there. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> to somebody who's experienced with disinformation, and, you know, Russia has been spreading uh, disinformation about biolabs on its borders for years. So it's like, for me, it was personally, it was nothing new uh, when they started talking about it again at the start of the invasion. But then my friend got in touch um, and her mother-in-law was absolutely scared of Ukrainian bioweapons and she was having nearly panic attacks uh, about the possibility of Ukraine developing this this um, this weapons um, at the, the labor at, at these laboratories um, and just hearing that made me feel that you know we do need to there there is a you know public interest and there is a need to push back against these kind of claims and yes they do sound they may sound to somebody as out there and not worth you know unpicking not worth giving it more oxygen but if it's already reached people so widely around the world and in russia itself in this particular case we have to step in, we have to provide that context. And she was trying to actually talk to her and, and explain, my friend, she was trying to talk to her and was trying to explain to her that that is not true, but she didn't have all the arguments. And so it sort of the conversation fell apart and it became very emotional. So also, and it, last, last point, part of what media organizations can also do and what we've been doing and um, the our disinformation correspondent Mariana Spring has been um, amazing at doing is trying to explain to people how to talk to, to people who believe in conspiracy theories, people who have been affected by disinformation, including your loved ones, because we often tend to just dismiss these people and just say that, oh, laugh, laugh at them or, or completely completely disengage but it's so important to you know show empathy and and talk to these people um and i think media organizations can help people you know give tips and and explain how it might be best to do that Sarin, do, do you think there's a, a different threat faced by democracies depending on where in the world they are, what, what stage of democratic development they are? I'm thinking of the, these bold claims that are being made about the existential threat to democracy in the US, for example, compared to, say, India, where it is a relatively robust democracy, but with a government that's becoming increasingly censorious. Is the challenge different depending on that, that localised context? Yeah. Um, first of all, if I can go back to uh, one of the previous questions, I was hesitant to come in because I'm not a specialist in media or journalism, uh, but I also watched, you know, developments in Europe and in America, for example, and also in India, the, you know, uh, so-called democracies, with both interest and concern, right? Um, 
but you know, I think one of the main differences we should see between you know, what is going on in Europe and America today, for example, uh, uh, and you know, what Russia and China and other such countries are doing is, uh, you know, we, we should be vigilant you know, in UK and you know, America or you know, in India uh, in you know, protecting our rights and uh, so protecting democracy and all of that. Um, but you know, uh, what, what a crucial difference is in, in Europe or in UK, for example, or in America, there are lots of uh, you know, media organizations with different sort of ideological inclinations, interests, and you know, unless they break a law or something, you know, they, they are free to operate, right? Uh, and you know, there isn't the British government or the American government sort of uh, persecuting you if you write or say something against the prime minister or the president. Uh, there, there isn't the government uh, you know, persecuting a scholar, uh, whether at home or abroad, for just doing their job, right? For in my case, for example, I'm, I was born in Tibet, and I write about Tibet, I do research about Tibet, and I work in a British university, but I have family back home, right? And uh, so I'm, you know, sort of exhibit A in terms of uh, a particular government uh, trying to control what I say, what I write, by not just sort of surveilling me, uh, controlling me, but also by using my relatives and family back home, right? So I, I, just to prove my point, I don't want to say too much, uh, so that you know, uh, uh, you know, it creates unnecessary trouble. Uh, so I, I think it's important to distinguish, you know, these you know, make this distinction. Uh, but you know, going back to your you know, question very clearly, I think uh, uh, there is this big, you know, distinction made about sort of stable and advanced, consolidated democracies and countries that have gone into democratic transition soon, right? And the role that democracy plays in uh, fostering peace, uh, stability, or uh, in violence is quite complex, right? The more advanced and consolidated your democracy is, when your institutions are strong, uh, uh, then you know, a democracy can have a peaceful and stabilizing influence. But when you are a new democracy, where the institutions are not strong, uh, where you know you have this competitive election with uh, you know freedom of expression for the candidates and for the supporters, and particularly when it's a divided society right, along religious or ethnic lines, uh, there is this combustible mix of competitive election, freedom to criticize and malign you know other members of your group just because you need you know votes from your own group, right? So that can create more violence and instability and conflict, right? So they, but with regard to India, uh, I would say there, there is this recent you know, development of a particular prime minister and a party uh, using religion and sort of, uh, in a way, poison the political system to some extent. But we should also know that India has gone through these kind of crises. Right? There was, uh, more or less a dictatorship uh, declared by Indira Gandhi, right, in the form of the emergency, where individuals were persecuted. Uh, but India went, overcame that and, you know, uh, moved on, right. And then, then India has a vibrant, uh, you know, electoral culture, vibrant media, you know, system, uh, and quite a sort of strong in courts. Of course, there are, you know, flaws there. Uh, which probably puts India in a different category from, say, you know, newly democratized societies. I've got one final question to everyone on the panel before thrown open to, to the audience, because keen to hear from other folk in the room. But just particularly because James Nogle were mentioning the, the importance of media literacy there, there's quite a lot of emphasis in the UK around the topic of media literacy on children and young people. How can we deliver this through schools, looking at the example of the really great work that's taken place in Finland on this. But are young people the right generation to focus on if, if, this, if this is an urgent question of media literacy? Are those who've grown up as, as digital natives actually the most susceptible to disinformation? 
or is it generations who are well past the point of being in that captive audience of, of education who we should be focusing on? Olga, you leaned well, right in there, I'm so I'm presuming yeah, you're, you're I, keen. I muted myself straight away. Um, <laughs> I think the most important thing, I think, for us to understand when it comes to audiences is that, um, and I hear I will literally repeat what a conspiracy expert that I spoke the other day to said to me is that anyone is susceptible to disinformation absolutely your your age your gender your your level of education your um you know your background they don't matter we're all human and we're all susceptible to disinformation because a lot of disinformation feeds into our own biases and, and we may not even realize that we have them so i think it's important to focus on um on young people but it Whenever we produce, in my department, when we think about media literacy, we think about media literacy for everyone, because I think it's equally important for young generations and older generations to know the basics, know how to distinguish what is false, what is what is fake, what isn't, um, and have this understanding and know how to practically use it. Because you know, you can. We are a small team. We can debunk only so much, but there's so much out disinformation, misinformation out there, and and people need to be, you know, prepared for the challenge of of uh, living in on, on in an online world. Anybody else want to come in on the question of? Because what I'm particularly interested in is how we then go about doing that. Because to take a personal perspective, I've felt that a lot of our focus on tackling, equipping children, young people with the skills to critically think and evaluate and spot disinformation just comes from the fact that that's the easiest age group for us to do that with because it's a captive audience. You can design lessons around it, you can include it in the curriculum. How to educate the adult population around any issue is simply far more difficult because they're not in full-time education. So how, how do we go about equipping the adult population with the kind of critical thinking skills to be able to to, as James, you're making the point, to do this for themselves rather than to have the government tell them what is and is not correct. I, I, th I think there's a role for social media organisations and digital media companies because I think a big problem here is the algorithms that, that operate these systems means that we're only subjected to or we only see um, stories that play to our biases already, as, uh, as Olga says. So if, we, if we're not seeing other stories... Um, uh, stories that might, might contradict where we're coming from that play to our existing biases, then we're not learning, we're not learning anything. And I think you know, we need stories that cut through those algorithms that say, uh, you know, teaching people to engage critically with media content is more important than just giving people, you know, playing to their, uh, their desires and what, whatever their search history has thrown up in the past. So I think there's a real part for social media organisations to play, to make sure that everyone that Olga is talking about, across the ages, across the genders, across uh, 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 society, gets sight of and engages with that kind of, with that kind of content. Joanna? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Olga said in terms of, you know, that we're all susceptible um, to, to, from time to time, you know, um, absorbing disinformation and misinformation, and it applies to every generation. And of course, as you said, you know, older generations who've already left the education system are harder to sort of um, reach with, you know, the warnings and, and so on. Um, I mean, I think, yes, as, as, as James uh, said, you know, platforms can help. And actually, steps that have already been taken, some steps have been quite effective. I mean, if you think about Twitter's um, sort of reminder to have you read this article be before you, um, you know, circulate it, share it further, that, that has been shown to be, you know, this, this friction that you introduce into the system, it slows down the spread of potentially misleading information. And, and that, that has been relatively effective. And the labels that have been added, you know, that this broadcaster is funded by the Russian government, this broadcaster is funded by the Chinese government, you know, all those little um, labels um, help to educate people as the, in the process of, of, of sort of using um, social media and, and, and online sources and so on. Um, and I guess just, you know, continued conversations like this where people have, you know, the opportunity to, to discuss, to learn from each other. Um, I mean, there's no silver bullet to this problem, obviously. Um, education is super important at every level. Um, I think, you know, 
just because um, you know the current younger generations are the digital generation doesn't mean that they know everything. Um, so it's important to, to include some kind of media literacy training as, as in part of the, in the curriculum, I, I would say. But I, I would also, and perhaps you know, as my kind of concluding thought, um, you know, I, I don't think this should be all about teaching people to fact check. I think it should also be about teaching people to value check, because it's not just the untruth in the sort of Russian narrative that's the problem. It's the fact that they promote hate, basically. And I think you know that we just need to get people to think, okay, you know, when I'm when I'm reading the news, when I'm consuming this or that source, you know, what is this doing to me emotionally, <laughs> to my, you know, to, to, my, to my psychology, as it were, and, and just trying to get people to take a step back. If it's, you know, hate-filled content, take a step back from that and be, you know, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's not just about checking facts. Me media literacy is not just about checking facts. It's also about checking your own emotional reaction and, and not being led into these sort of um, yeah, hate-filled bubbles. Just on that um, point, or, uh, Twitter and the, the new system, the relatively mm -hmm. new system they've got of marking particularly uh, mm -hmm. state-sponsored uh, mm -hmm. media outlets, political candidates in mm -hmm. some countries but, but not others, is that a s sustainable model, essentially relying on the good judgment of social mm -hmm. media platforms to do that? For example, clearly labelling an RT propagandist, but from the Russian government's perspective, Olga is a propagandist for the yeah. British government. How sustainable is it for us to rely on Twitter to show enough good judgment to <laughs> flag up the dangers of RT, Sputnik, etc., but recognise the difference between them and what we consider to be free media? Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed on YouTube the other day that, that BBC does have a, a, a sort of label now that this is a public broadcaster mm. of the UK. So, I mean, labels can be attached to you know all kinds of news organisations, not just the foreign governments that we have difficult relationships with. Um, I mean, I think in general, informing people about the nature of the source that they're consuming, whatever that source might be, um, is, is, a, is a good idea. Um, and yeah, I guess we, we do have to be careful not to um, sort of put ourselves in a position where we can be accused of, of double standards. But in terms of who does what, you know, what is, what's the government's responsibility and what's um, you know, private platforms responsibility. I mean, that's an ongoing conversation. I know we've got at least one person in the room from Ofcom um, who might want to <laughs> um, continue that conversation afterwards. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because the, the platforms in some ways have greater expertise, even greater power than governments to, to make suggestions, to change things. Um, so it's, it's a conversation that needs to continue, really. Um, and Sarah, would you like the last word on this question? Yeah, um, I think um, I think it, it, it's important to um, you know bring about media literacy uh, as well, uh, but also to uh, increase access to higher education because I, I've been reading about correlations between you know um, people with more sort of parochial or racist uh, you know attitudes with you know uh, their you know, level of education. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, both in America and also in mm. U UK. And uh, so I think it's important to, uh, for governments to bring about greater access to higher education so that, they, you know, they, you know uh, before they become sort of fully fleshed adults, they, they have been, you know, uh, sort of trained to recognize misinformation, disinformation, and all of that. But I think it's also important to strengthen the, the deterrence uh, you know, uh, power uh, to deter, you know, people from uh, engaging in disinformation, right? So I, I was thinking about Alex Jones and, you know, the court uh, sort of, uh, cases he has been facing in the U.S. for talking about the uh, shooting, uh, school shooting, and the, uh, the, the fact that he, ha he, he had, has to pay, uh, you know, millions of pounds. Uh, so it, it, I think there are laws uh, which needs to be uh, sort of strengthened uh, to deter as well. But I think you know, going back to uh, what you know, um, uh, media companies, social media networks can do is, uh, I I for example, when the American government and also the UK government um, sort of uh, classified many of the Chinese media organizations as foreign agents, right? So uh, YouTube and these social media organizations uh, have to put up this notification that they are you know, fully or partly funded by the Chinese government or the American government or something like that. Uh, but Chinese government has been you know, very clever in responding to that 
by hiring Western uh, expats or influencers uh, to you know make videos, give you know access to Xinjiang, Tibet, various parts of China to them, access to official sources, and you know make them make videos supportive of the you know Chinese government's policies and also uh, you know CCP's uh, sort of lines. Uh, uh, and in fact, many of them are hired as stringers by CTGN and many you know, Western sort of Chinese uh, uh, media agencies. Uh, and they, are, you know, they have sort of different types of relationships with the Chinese government and these media organizations. Uh, but uh, you know, YouTube and the, you know, Twitter, you know, they do not classify them as Chinese agents, right? Uh, talking about, you know, uh, putting forward Chinese uh, lines. So I think you know, uh, there are lots of things that the governments and media organizations and social media organizations can do as well to fight uh, disinformation. Thanks very much. I hope everybody found that uh, an interesting and enlivening discussion. We've got about 20 minutes left now to take some questions from the floor. So we've got uh, some folk at the back who've got roving microphones. If you'd like to ask a question, if you could stick your hand up uh, and I'll direct the microphone to you. It's always the case that the first question is the opposite side of the room from where the microphone is. So our first question is in the very first row here. Uh, so it's just right on the, the corner there. Does our on-screen participant or any of the panel have any comment to, come, to make on the role of Bellingcat in all of this? And could I say to you from Tibet, I feel a deep and lasting shame as to the United Kingdom's stance on Tibet. Thank you. Olga, would you like to... Would you like to kick us off on that one, on the role of, of Bell and Cat and how the, the landscape has changed quite radically in the period that they've been operating? Well, <laughs> Bell and Cat is a very well-known organisation right now, and uh, um, they're... they're they're well known among journalists just for the, the sheer work they're doing and the their ability to, um, you know, dig really deep into um, open source investigations. So I think it's they've played a, a big role in promoting the idea of you know citizen journalism and uh, um, open source investigations. And uh, I think inspire even inspiring some newsrooms to um, to because they, they've been so successful at documenting, um, you know, war crimes and um, um, and wrongdoing in, in uh, uh, war zones in Syria and now in Ukraine. Um, I think they they've prompted at least some some join, some newsrooms to even invest in in developing similar skills in their own um, in their own newsrooms. Um, and I know that some um, former Bellingcat uh, experts have even been working in uh, on some of the investigations together with um, journalists from from the BBC, uh, for example, Africa Eye, um, and so on. So definitely, I mean, Bellingcat is a, they are, I think, widely seen as world experts when it comes to um, when it comes to um, open source investigations. And uh, it's I suppose hard to underestimate their imp the impact that they have they've had over the past few years on the development of the OSINT community. Anybody else like to come in on on the role of Bell and Cat and the impact that they've had? I, I mean, I think connected to this, you're all also we're already seeing bigger collaborations between established journalists and other organisations like Bell and Cat, but also like the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in the UK. We're seeing, you know, but also uh, media organisations across sort of broadcast and print. So you, you've got uh, uh, Channel 4 News and Guardian having a collaboration around Cambridge Analytica and you're having uh, uh, Bureau of Investigative Journalism working with other media organisations because I think um, what Bellingcat showed us is that there, you can have some really big, ambitious investigative journalism that can have a big impact, but it's expensive and it takes time and it takes a group of people with unique skills that can dig into the dark web and, and so on. So I think, you know, these kind of big collaborations that I hope are going to get more common as, as we need these kind of big, ambitious investigations. 
Would anybody else like to come in with a question? Uh, so we've got one up the back, and I think if there's more than one, I'm going to take the questions in groups just because we're relatively condensed. So I'll take the first question up the back, and if anybody else got one, if you want to set your hand straight up. Uh, so we'll come next to the gentleman in the far end, and then we'll take all three in a, in a group. Um, so what you said earlier about YouTube and how it can almost filter into Russia in some way, uh, kind of sort of piqued my curiosity, and it also kind of linked in with what you're saying about trust in the judgment of social media organisations and I was wondering about should there sort of be a moral responsibility in these organisations such as Google who own YouTube to push sort of these what would we would class as true information in Ukraine would they would they have a responsibility to push it into Russian visitors to the website but again it is also that, that judgment of social media, it's trusting that, and would, could it possibly end up even backfiring and just result in a blanket ban and things like YouTube and anything that was getting through the cracks just ends up getting stopped? Thanks very much, really interesting question. Do, do these platforms have a moral obligation to be an active participant in, in situations like that, the conflict? So we'll come here and then the third and final question there. Uh, thanks, Ross. Um, all, all democracies can tolerate opposition. That was a, a general statement made um, and I agree by and large with that. The current Conservative government is considering selling off Channel 4, um, uh, which would likely make it less incisive. How should we or, or can we react or respond to this? Excellent. Thanks, Ron. And third question here. Hi. Hi. Uh, this relates very much to that question that's just been asked. And taking aside BBC's sort of constraints in terms of you know, impartiality. I would take the view that one of the biggest spreaders of disinformation in this country is our own mainstream media, because they allow politicians, and I'm talking mostly Westminster politicians, to come on and talk total bollocks, and they, <laughs> they do not challenge them. I think the media is, is split into two. There's those whose key skill is reading out loud, and that those whose key skill is as journalists. And I think Channel 4 falls into that category. And I wonder if that's why the government is so keen to change its remit. Excellent. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to dive in on any of these questions? I don't mind taking the one about YouTube in Russia. Please I'll do, the domestic politics to other people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think social media platforms in Russia and in other authoritarian states, so you know they, it's a, it's a tricky line to walk in terms of you know to what extent do they comply with um, you know laws in these you know rep repressive states and to what extent do they try and push boundaries and, and give people access to information that the governments there don't want them to see. I mean, thinking hypothetically, I mean, could I mean YouTube is already you know an important source of. Um, oh, I don't know what you would call it, alternative news, news that, that doesn't align with, with the position of the Russian government within, within Russia. So, I mean, it, it's already playing an important role. And I'm, I'm personally quite surprised that the Russian government hasn't banned YouTube yet. I don't know if, I mean, Olga might have think things to say about why it hasn't yet banned YouTube. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure we can place the responsibility on the tech platforms to, to sort of reach audiences in, in, in hard to reach places, um, I mean, it, I, but I mean, the, the, the fundamental problem, I guess, in, in Russia is that, you, you know, you can put information out there, you can put, you know, um, and, and there are, you know, there are lots of videos, people trying to convince um, the Russian audience, you know, via YouTube videos about the reality of what's happening in, in Ukraine, but the sort of, the, the, the resistance within the Russian population to, to consuming that kind of critical content, to taking it seriously, is is it's, it's like a wall. I mean, they've they've constructed this sort of nationalist um, sort of wall in in their heads that anybody who criticizes Russia must, by definition, be lying because the West and Ukraine are waging information war against Russia, and, and therefore you know you're not to take seriously any kind of criticism. I, I mean, Russian propagandists are right out there saying that you know telling the Russian population that your first duty is to support your country. Don't 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 bother about critical thinking. So it's it's a difficult task. Whoever's whoever the, whoever the responsibility is, it's it's a very difficult task. Um. 
Excellent. Generally, I'd say Russia and YouTube is a fascinating story, and and uh, I do find it quite fascinating that that they still haven't banned it because it is freely available and uh, it does provide a glimpse um, into the kind of reality of war in Ukraine. Um, and when you do like Google, uh, if if you Google things in Yandex, which are related to Ukraine war, um, very often you would see links to YouTube that would provide that glimpse. And that would be like one of the very, very few things that are not programming. Um, but I don't know the answer to, to the question why they haven't banned it. The one speculation though would be is that YouTube is incredibly popular in Russia and banning it would probably make a lot of people angry because, and also we need to understand how people use YouTube in Russia it's largely for entertainment purposes rather than rather than to get news um, so if these people live in these bubbles where they look for recipes cat and dog videos and they're not specifically looking for Ukraine um, information the algorithms are not gonna start all of a sudden leading them into the kind of rabbit hole of Ukraine news so that's that might be one explanation, but there might be the reason, the real reason might be completely different. It's it's just what what sort of w would be a logical explanation that it might it might actually make a lot of people angry because we know that there is a there is a the Russian version of YouTube which is called Rootube and it is not popular <laughs> at all <laughs> as far as I know. Uh, nobody I know watches it or or uses it. Uh, so, but but in general, yeah, the the this curious case of YouTube in Russia is fairly interesting. James, would be, yeah, yeah, come on in. Can I just ask you um, when you said uh, maybe that's why they want us to shut down Channel Four? Did you mean that Channel Four does challenge politicians? Yeah, or, okay. Channel Four uses journalists rather than news readers. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, I mean, so I, I've spent most of my career at Channel 4 News, so that's a sort of disclaimer. <laughs> um, uh, 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 but I've also worked at ITV News and the old News at 10 with Trevor McDonald, and I've worked at the BBC and BBC Radio and so on. So I, I've kind of worked across different broadcast outlets. Uh, and I would say that, you know, I feel really strongly that we need a diverse media, uh, a, a, a diverse broadcast media. So we need... Uh, uh, um, media organizations and institutions that are doing different things, that are telling different stories in different ways to different audiences. I think what the BBC does is great, but it cannot be the only big media organization that we have. I think the um, commercial broadcasters, I think what they do is fantastic, and I ITV News and Channel 5 News and so on. But I think what uh, Channel 4 does and where it is, is in a unique position as a public service broadcaster that is not funded by a license fee, but is funded by advertising and has a very specific public service agenda, which is to foster new talent, which is to, to, to tell stories uh, uh, for, for and by minorities in the UK and so on. That I think is really precious. I don't think there is any, any other media organisation in the world that is like that and has that. I think it's a really important part of um, our media landscape in the UK. But then I would say that, wouldn't I, because I work for Channel 4 News. So, but yes, but, but, so I fear it's sell-off because I fear it will become a commercial broadcaster and I fear what would happen Depending on who, depending on who buys it and who owns it, I don't speak for Channel Four or ITN and so on. But but in my, in my in, it, from my point of view, I think diversity has to come first. That is really important, and I think we would be throwing away something really really precious if we were to sell Channel Four. Can I be slightly provocative, James? Go for it. Um, is there a an issue perhaps with our traditional media being? perhaps too self-congratulatory or too defensive, that when we have a lot of these discussions around misinformation and disinformation, there's often a slightly ref reflexive uh, approach from journalists, whether it's in print or broadcasting, that these are the problems of social media and that they, they exist in a much more uh, a noble profession that is not quite infallible, uh, but perhaps much closer to it than, than the public might think. There's, you certainly see, I mean, we get 
as politicians, we get feedback in our inboxes about typically about the BBC rather than about public service broadcasters. Not always fair, but you tend to find currents coming from different political perspectives. But the common theme is that people feel that the journalists interviewing the politicians are the same kind of people who went to the same kind of schools and the same kind of universities, who live in the same kind of streets in the same London suburbs. And there's an element of groupthink there that results in a lack of challenge. Yeah. Is, is that fair? I think that's fair. And I think we, you know, when I talk about diversity, I'm not only talking about diversity in terms of the organisations and the ownership. I'm talking about diversity as in we need our journalism and our media staff to be diverse so that they, we can tell stories from across the communities and the areas of the UK and make sure that all of those are covered. I think. Um, I don't agree that Channel 4 is the... I think pretty much most of our mainstream broadcasters do a good job at challenging um, uh, uh, politicians in particular. I think there is a problem with... Um, I think, well, there's, there's a couple of problems. I think there's a problem with politicians, and I think there's a problem with the way that we tell stories. So if you think about a um, conventional news bulletin, it's a half-hour programme, whether it's on BBC or ITV or Channel 5 or, or, or whatever. So within that, you generally have a reporter package, which is generally two and a half minutes, three minutes long. Within that reporter package, you're supposed to tell the story. And, it, and to comply with Ofcom rules, you've got to make sure that there's a balance. If, there's, so you, if, you, if you interview one politician, then you've got to interview politicians from the other side. That's fine. But the logistics of it, and the reality is... That if you're telling, if you've only got two and a half minutes or three minutes to tell a story, and you're having two or three sound bites, each sound bite is going to be 15, 20 seconds or so. So you've got one sound bite from one politician on one side, one sound bite from another politician on the other side, because you're balanced and you're accurate and you're fair. Okay, the politicians know this, and I have, um, I run out of patience with the, the amount of times I've interviewed a politician, I've asked a question. And they know because I'm only going to, I'm going to use one soundbite. Um, and quite often, they will not engage with the question at all. They will just give me the answer that they want me to use. Do you see what I mean? Because, you know, I need to use a soundbite from them. They give me the soundbite they want me to use. And as a journalist, it's really, really frustrating. So I ask the question again. They give me the soundbite that they want me to use again. And I ask the question again. And, and, and uh, that... I think is really difficult because I don't have the time to, to be seen to be challenging this politician because I've only got two, two minutes 30 to tell the story. So what do I do? I either don't use the soundbite at all, which, I, which, is, which I've done in the past quite a lot because, you know, hang on a second, they've not engaged with my question at all. Or you use the soundbite that, 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 that you want to, or you kind of write into it or whatever. So I that... Don't, I, I don't interview any of them. Well, but then if you're telling a politi political story and these are our representatives, you know, and so it's, it's difficult. I think what, what um, digital platforms and social media does enable us to do, which I think is, which I think is good, is that um, if I were to do an interview, and I'm only going to use 20 seconds, what's to stop me taking the whole unedited interview and putting it up on Twitter or putting it up on Facebook? Mm. And then you can say... Look at how they didn't answer the question. Look at how they dodged what I was trying to answer. Look at how I was trying to challenge them, but they weren't. So I think there's, there's a real opportunity there in social media that you can sh show a bit of the reality of how these things work behind, behind the doors. And I think politicians are beginning to realise that and that they kind of need to, they need to engage with the question. doesn't mean to say that... They still don't want you to, to use their sound. Of course they do. But I, but I hope that politicians are more and more engaging with the question and are, and, 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 and are challenged by it, rather than just seeing it as an opportunity for them to get their 20-second message on the TV. But you can see how that's... That, you know, that... It just, and, it, and it's, you know, it's the problem of the bulletin uh, and the problem of the program. Now, what, you know, what, what Channel 4 enables us to do and Newsnight and, and other programs on Sky and so on 
is that if you've got more time, and particularly if you've got live interviews, you can get politicians in and you can really challenge them and you can make sure that they don't dodge the question. And I think that can be more successful in terms of engaging and challenging with people in authority. I'm struck there by, it's getting on a bit now, I think it's 11 years ago, there's an infamous clip of Ed Miliband, these strikes are wrong, which is the ultimate example of that, where he had one soundbite to say a particular public sector strike was wrong. He was asked the question about 12 different times, and it was just 12 different ways of rearranging the words for these, these strikes are wrong, which worked perfectly when it was broadcast on the BBC News at 6. It didn't work so well when the BBC then uploaded the full five minutes of him saying the same thing over and over again in response to different questions. And I am just as guilty of that, because the question then becomes where, where is the incentive for the politicians to give that longer form answer? We're not on the news, oops, we're not on the news every day. I've got 10 seconds a week where I might be on Report in Scotland, if I want to get my 10 seconds across, I need to be incentivised to answer the questions that, that are being asked, which is a cynical way of looking at it, but that's, that's politics. Um, and, and, and the, but the journalists aren't blameless either, because if a, if a politician were to say, as part of an answer, if they were to admit some kind of blame for something, or yes, we got it wrong, that would be the bit that would end up being yeah. used and not the positive bit that they, that, that they want. So I think there is a real problem with you know, conventional storytelling, conventional yeah. news, that it doesn't cut and across really some of a, these complaints. Really is a public policy question, simple enough for the 10 second answer no, to, be, to be adequate. Saying I've totally lost my time management, so you get the final uh, word here, but feel free to take as long as you want with that final word. <laughs> <laughs> very, very brief thing to say, I didn't want to come in because I wanted to practice what I preach by not misinforming you about matters that I am not fully informed about myself. But on the latest point about how journalists you know, conduct sort of interviews, uh, on international affairs, I think it's not just that the journalists you know, don't ask difficult questions, but they, they are not fully informed. They're not knowledgeable. I think I'm not talking about all journalists, of, of course. But I uh, saw interviews of the former uh, Chinese ambassador to UK by Andrew Ma, and an interview of the Chinese ambassador to the US, uh, former Chinese ambassador to the US by uh, Christian Amanbo on CNN. And one thing that struck me when to they were talking about the, uh, so, uh, the genocide and the issues in Xinjiang, uh, the Chinese ambassadors said, you know, there is no genocide because the population in Xinjiang of the Uyghurs has risk doubled from 1949 to 19, uh, you know, up to now, right? And they s s do similar kind of uh, narratives about Tibet. But the, uh, they just let them, you know, escape, uh, get away with that. Uh, I mean, if they were more fully informed, they would have talked about the percentage of, of the population of Xinjiang that the Uyghurs compose today, uh, which is just under 45% when it was almost 80% in 1949, right? And when to talking about you know, genocide, it's not just about physical el elimination of, uh, of, of a people, but the psychological makeup, the cultural identity, all of these uh, should also be taken into account, right? So they both managed to get away uh, without being challenged. That is absolutely true, even on a domestic level as well. If you look at Scottish print publications, the number of newspapers in Scotland who still have an education correspondent and a health correspondent and an environment correspondent and a justice correspondent, basically nil. You've got very, very general journalists trying to cover all of these issues and it's not a criticism of them to say they don't have the depth of knowledge in every one of these fields, which then does make the job easier for folk like myself because I'm not being asked the difficult questions because the journalist isn't familiar enough with the issue to ask them. We've ran over time, I'm afraid, though, so apologies for folk who, who wanted to ask a question, didn't have time to do that. Can I just say a final round of, of thanks to, to Sering, to Joanna, James and Olga. I found this a really interesting and engaging conversation. I hope you have as well, so hope we can all thank our, our panel for their contributions. Thank you.